Uh, it's my pleasure to um, welcome you to this event, Challenges of the Broader Middle East, by Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad. Uh, this is someone who comes from uh, our own institution, and uh, Zal, as I gather he was known, Zal was a um, assistant professor of political science in SIPA uh, here for 10 years, from 1979 uh, to 1989. Had many posts uh, in uh, the U.S. government over the years, formerly the U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan and, of course, U.S. ambassador to Iraq. He has been immersed in American foreign policy, especially with respect to the Middle East, uh, since the early 1980s. Currently, he is the highest ranking Afghan American and Muslim in the administration of President George Bush, as well as a leading force in the U.S. occupancy and restructuring uh, of uh, Iraq. Uh, under President George H.W. Bush, uh, the ambassador served in the Defense Department as Deputy Undersecretary for Policy Planning. He also served in President Ronald Reagan's administration as a senior State Department official advising on the Soviet war in Afghanistan and the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, this is a regular tradition of having the permanent representative to the United Nations, the ambassador, here to speak. We're very pleased to have this opportunity to discuss the Middle East. Uh, we all know that uh, how to understand uh, the variety of issues and the problems and the potential of the Middle East is utterly captivating to us. Uh, and we know that it is filled and fraught with controversy. Uh, and to help us try to understand this better today, uh, we have the ambassador uh, to the United Nations. Mr. Ambassador, thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction, uh, President Bollinger. It was very kind, uh, given this setting and your reputation for uh, introductions. <laughs> I was prepared for a lot worse. <laughs> uh, more seriously, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be back at Columbia. Uh, I remember fondly my years here uh, living on Morningside Drive, having our first son Alexander born here, and uh, having very many excellent uh, students and colleagues, and I see some of them uh, here today. Uh, today, uh, I would like to talk about the challenges of the broader Middle East, and in doing so, I want to approach the subject by discussing how the best traditions of U.S. foreign policy serve as a template to address these challenges. Then I look forward to taking your questions and comments. In an election year, it should not be surprising to see that partisanship extends to debates about foreign policy. Yet, if we step back to view the great sweep of American engagement in the world, we find that American policy has involved a blend of realism and understanding of the realities of power politics and, I, and the idealism of using American power for higher values to improve the human condition. One aspect of this tradition is particularly relevant today. America's use of sustained, creative statecraft to help transform the politics of key regions, to normalize them, to enable regions to evolve from a condition dominated by conflict, oppression, and instability to one characterized by stability and progress. The United States played a key catalytic role in Europe by pressing for self-determination after World War I, enabling Western Europe to stand on its own feet after World War II, 
and to withstand the Soviet challenge during the Cold War, and helping to create a united and free Europe after the collapse of the Soviet Empire. We also played such a role in East Asia, though with a different formula. We enabled Japan to join the community of free nations, defended South Korea, helping them both to become economic powerhouses and strong allies of the United States. At the same time, we established an array of bilateral security relationships that even today are the foundations of the region's geopolitical stability. We also engaged communist China in a way that consolidated the split with the Soviet Union and created external conditions that opened the country to the world. In Latin America, the United States was a positive force for political and economic development in, 20, in the 20th century, launching the Good Neighbor Policies and the FDR and the Alliance for Progress and their JFK, helping to oppose communist subversion, pr providing help to strengthen state institutions, supporting democratic transitions, and opening our markets to trade to enable economic growth. With, with respect to all of these policies, we had internal debates, even sharp disagreements on specific issues, but successive administrations of both parties carried out this tradition of catalyzing regional change and progress. None of this was simple or cost-free. Thousands of Americans gave their lives in these efforts, and there were significant financial costs as well. However, this work of generations made a tremendous positive contribution to the shape of the world in which we live today. The task for us now is to apply this tradition in our foreign policy to the situation in the broader Middle East. This is geopolitically, in my judgment, the defining issue of our time. To succeed, we have to develop a comparable set of strategies and policies to address the many interrelated challenges of this region and will require sustained implementation over generations. Yet, if we apply ourselves in the ways we have in the past, I have no doubt that we can succeed. Let's now turn to the Middle East, starting with a diagnosis of the challenges. There is a struggle going on for the future of the region. At the center of the struggle is a crisis within Islamic civilization between those who adhere to the traditional or moderate view of the faith and those who argue that only an extreme and intolerant vision of Islam is true to the Quran and that Muslims who do not agree with them have abandoned their religion. This struggle between moderates and extremists is about what it means to be a Muslim, what it means to be successful in this world and how Muslims relate to others in their midst or in other countries. The extremists blame the problems of the Muslim world on the United States and, the, and other Western powers and on Muslims who do not follow their extremist interpretation of Islamic doctrine. Their doctrine demands that there can be no peace until they are dominant, using persuasion, provision of social services, intimidation and violence to try to obtain control of Muslim countries. They believe their climb to power will be accelerated by provoking a clash between Islamic society and the rest of the world. These extremists are a minority phenomenon in the region as a whole, but they dominate parts of it. They've gained global prominence in recent years, largely because of terrorist tactics. We can observe the struggle within Islam throughout the broader Middle East. There are many factors that provide oxygen to extremists. The dysfunctional politics in the broader Middle East, both within and among states, create dangerous opportunities. When governments fail to deliver in terms of basic government services, security, or social, political, and economic progress, the stagnation leads to a kind of despair where extremism appears a rational option. In a rapidly changing and uncertain world, Religion can be a solace and a vulnerability. Religious movements that define themselves in unambiguous extremist terms 
such as Al-Qaeda, prey on those searching for explanation. When regional conflicts remain unresolved and produce widespread suffering, these consequences provide a pretext for extremists to justify their violent acts. And rivalries among states further inflame instability as rivals exploit religious appeals to recruit proxy forces to go into neighboring countries. We and the rest of the world cannot be indifferent about the future of the broader Middle East. The evolution of this region will have a profound impact on the future of the world. The overall goal of our policy is and must remain to contain and weaken the extremists, cultivate and empower moderates, and encourage the normalization of this region. The United States and our allies must also ensure that no hostile power achieves hegemony over the region. This is a vital interest of the United States. And we need to maintain the needed military presence as an element of a comprehensive strategy. Of course, the normalization of this region is primarily the responsibility of local political forces. But we must help them as they transform that region from one beset by instability and violence to one characterized by peace and progress, just as we have in Europe, East Asia, and Latin America. This cannot be done quickly, easily, or cheaply. It will not be done solely or even principally by military means. It will require work on many fronts, and as I said before, a comprehensive approach. In my judgment, there are eight major pillars to such an approach. One, reducing our vulnerability to disruptive events in the broader Middle East. Two, staying on the offense against extremist groups such as Al-Qaeda that utilize terrorism as their principal tactic. Three, working to resolve regional tensions such as the Arab-Israeli conflict that fuel resentment and instability. Four, responding to Iran's assertive pursuit of regional hegemony. Five, mobilizing in partnership with our friends in the region to marginalize extremists and to help the nations of the region normalize their societies and politics. Six, helping to promote economic opportunity through reform and integration of the broader Middle East into the international economy. Seven, elevating cooperative efforts in the Middle East as a central organizing principle for our major alliances and in our participation in multilateral institutions. And finally, reforming our instruments on policy to make them more effective for dealing with the challenges arising from the broader Middle East. In the light of the limit of time, I would like to focus today on just the fifth pillar, helping nations to marginalize extremists and normalize their societies and politics, but I'll be happy to discuss any of the other elements in our question and answer period. Let's step back for a moment to consider the nature of the challenge from Al-Qaeda and the other extremists. Its leaders want ultimately to have their ideology rule the Muslim world. However, one of their immediate objectives is to use violence and political warfare to, pro to propel themselves into a position where Muslims see them as the defenders of the Islamic faith and community. For Al-Qaeda, violence is a tactic its leaders use terrorism as an instrument. They use it against us to posture themselves as standing up to the West, against governments in the region to align themselves with local grievances, and against moderates to intimidate those who could offer more appealing visions of the future. This competition is played out on the complex strain of the Middle East where weak states, divided societies, Closed political systems and ethnic, sectarian, and regional rivalries present a myriad of cleavages and opportunities to exploit. In this regard, Al-Qaeda has shown a great political skill at times, yet at the same time it has made many mistakes, most recently by overplaying its hand among the Sunni Arabs in Iraq. The majority of the peoples of the Middle East do not wish to live under extremists tyrannical regimes such as that of the Taliban. They want their societies to be successful. They do not want to become like the West, but they want to enjoy the benefits, social, economic, and intellectual, of modernity. During the last five years, I've spent hundreds of hours talking with average Afghans and Iraqis 
about the future of their countries. They want indeed, they crave normalcy. The most powerful appeal we have is that we can help them build successful countries that are grounded in their own norms, cultures, and traditions. That should be, in my view, the core of our strategy. To carry this out, we need to work along three principal lines of action. First, the United States should help stable and moderate Muslim majority countries outside the Middle East succeed economically and politically. In Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and other regions, we should work in partnership with our friends, even if they are not, they are not now democratic, to build examples of success in the Muslim world. The Muslim majority countries of Southeast Asia, for example, Indonesia and Malaysia have developed open political and economic institutions. They have integrated diverse societies, Moderate and modernist political forces are well organized and dominate the political landscape. Though some of these nations face significant internal challenges, they are broadly successful and show that freedom and democracy are fully consistent with Islamic faith. For those in other parts of the Muslim world, these societies can give promise and hope. We should seek to dramatically increase their progress by collaboratively developing robust action plans in each country to strengthen institutions, to improve the rule of law, to increase grassroots economic growth, and to ensure that all segments of society enjoy the opportunities and benefits of our engagement. Enabling these societies to achieve a qualitative new level of success, demonstrating that what can be done in partnership with the United States and other leading democracies would represent a powerful challenge to the extremists. The second line of action is to work with our friends in the broader Middle East to adopt <laughs> differentiated and tailored strategies to advance processes of positive but stable pro uh, political change. For those states that are at risk, for example, Afghanistan and Iraq, we must remain committed providing the support needed for as long as it takes to enable these countries to stand on their own feet. As ambassador in Afghanistan and Iraq, I tried to work with locals with a simple formula. We were there to help Afghans and Iraqis establish systems based on universal values, but we understood that the constitution and institutions that would give these values life would be colored by Afghan and Iraqi history, culture, and religion. I found that this approach can work and that the key is to begin by aligning ourselves, that is posturing our country to support the highest aspirations of the people. Cynical reliance on strongmen or engaging in divide and rule is ultimately self-defeating. The quest for human dignity is the most powerful underlying political force in the world today. We need to align ourselves with that force. I'll give you three examples of how this worked in Afghanistan. They were all parts of the bond process, the set of political milestones that resulted in a new constitution and the first free and fair elections in Afghanistan's history. At the emergency Louis Jirga to select a transitional government in July of 2002, Afghans came together with the support of the international community. I saw how through this process, representatives from all the regions and ethnic groups, and many were on different sides of the civil war of the 1990s, came to see each other as members of the same community. They came to understand that they had a unique opportunity to set their country right after decades of war, but that success would involve patient step-by-step -step compromises with each other, worked out in partnership with the international community. We helped Afghans achieve psychological breakthroughs. At the Constitutional Law Jirga, we spent days and weeks engaged in discussions with Afghans as they sorted through the fundamental questions of political philosophy. What should be the power of the state? How should it be structured to achieve effective government while ensuring representation of all and preventing abuse of power? And how to blend respect for universal value with the unique character of Afghan culture? The result, again, an Afghan solution to Afghan problems, but developed with the assistance of the Friends of Afghanistan in the most progressive governing document in Afghan history. <coughs> One of the most memorable days for me was October 9, 2004 the date of the first elections of an Afghan head of state in the country's long history. I toured voting locations in Kabul, and I remember the awe in the eyes of voters. No Afghan was the same after that event, in my view. Each was elevated by the experience of choosing their own leader. 
I remember the words of one Afghan man who, who, quoted, who was quoted in the papers, reflecting on the country's emergence for a, from a quarter of centuries of conflict. He said, and I quote, finally, we are human again, end of quote. This rebirth of Afghanistan, this hope, this promise, was the result of American power and statecraft supported and executed in partnership with the United Nations and many other members of the international community. This is the model for how we can help countries realize that their potential. This is not to say that we have fully succeeded in Afghanistan. Much work remains to be done. The United States, as well as the rest of the international community, needs to do more to create a productive partnership with President Karzai and moderate political forces there. This partnership must re-accelerate state building and reconstruction, help create a robust agriculture sector that will reduce the incentive to grow opium, and mobilize the political forces in Afghan society that want to recreate the stable and moderate society that Afghanistan was before the Soviet invasion in 1979. In Iraq, the same, the same template, building up and reconciling moderates and marginalizing extremists that also produce progress. Tragically, in the aftermath of the coalition action to topple Saddam Hussein, Iraq's Shia Arab and Sunni Arab communities descended into a suicidal internal conflict. In 2003 and 2004, the Sunni Arabs rejected the political process and ended up boycotting the January 2005 elections, which resulted in a transitional government that was not fully representative and that further fueled mutual fears and conflict. Al-Qaeda took advantage of, of this divide and sought to deepen it by attacking Arab Shiite targets, leading Shiites to attack Sunni targets in retaliation. One of the priorities of my effort in Iraq was to overcome this division, to persuade the Sunni Arabs to join the political process, to broker a national compact among Iraqi communities and to unite Iraqis against Al-Qaeda and other violent extremists. I reached out to Sunni Arab political leaders, tribal sheikhs, even some leaders of the armed opposition. I engaged them. Though many suffered from a kind of counterproductive political nostalgia, a desire to return to the time when their community dominated the country, I argued with them that their future was at stake, that Sunni Arabs, if they stayed outside of the process, and if their region was consumed by intractable violence, would lose their historical advantages in education, technocratic skills, and economic skills. Slowly, steadily, many came to see through these discussions that the United States was not an occupier, but an honest broker. This process of engagement enabled the United States to mediate key provisions of the draft Iraqi constitution. It took weeks of patient political discussion, but ultimately, with some last minute compromises, Iraqis achieved. Iraqis arrived at a draft that could be ratified in a referendum. It also enabled us to secure Sunni Arab participation in the December 2005 elections, the formation of a government of national unity, consensus selection of a prime minister and key security ministers, and agreement on a path towards national reconciliation. Unfortunately, this positive trajectory was disrupted when the bombing of the Golden Mosque in Samarra triggered widespread sectarian violence. Yet this engagement with Sunni Arabs created the preconditions for the progress we are seeing today. Sunni Arabs who rejected participation in politics in the earlier stages after our forces went into Iraq are now participating in the political process and are helping fight Al-Qaeda in places like Ramadi and Fallujah. And Al-Qaeda has been substantially weakened. Afghanistan and Iraq are cases in which we are deeply involved on the ground. For those states that are friendly, but ruled by authoritarian government, the principle of helping these societies move forward is the same, but the tactics must be adjusted. We should engage the leaders of these countries in discussions to think through how political openings can be pursued without risking instability or giving an advantage to extremists that have organized themselves by clandestine means. Together with local allies, we need to think through the stages of transition, beginning with political openings that enable moderates to organize, followed up with political dialogue and processes that help elements of the current order create a relationship 
relationships with moderates to support a stable transition and culminating in agreed steps toward an ultimate transition to a representative government. The situation in Pakistan, for example, illustrates this challenge. Pakistanis are not extremists. About 85 to 90 percent of the population typically votes for non-religious parties in national elections. The country elected a woman as prime minister in the 1990s. However, the country is besieged by powerful extremist forces as evident in the recent assassination of Benazir Bhutto. Also, the current military-dominated political order has a narrow, even fragile, social base. The formula for progress is to bring the moderate elements in the government, including the military together with Pakistan's political parties and social forces in a dialogue that produces a roadmap to establishing a political order with full legitimacy in the eyes of the people capable of delivering social and economic results and sufficiently resilient to stand up and turn back the extremist challenge. And the United States, as well as the rest of the international community, should stand ready to provide appropriate support to enable the implementation of such a roadmap to a stable and successful Pakistan. Iran, whose leaders promote a revolution hostile to the United States, calls for a different approach. It may be possible to come to terms with Iran as a country which has a reasonable definition of its national interest. It is unlikely that an accommodation is possible with Iran as a revolution or an Iran which seeks regional hegemony and pursues nuclear weapons. The third and final line of action is to implement this pillar of the needed strategy for the Middle East is to under, sorry, the third and final line of action to implement this pillar of the needed strategy for the Middle East is to undertake a comprehensive forward engagement with civil society in Middle Eastern countries. There are moderates throughout the broader Middle East who reject intolerant views and the use of violence. Like people everywhere, they wish for a life of opportunity for themselves and their children. They want their nations to be successful, normal countries in which the people have basic security, decent jobs, and the ability to send their children to school, where one generation does better than its predecessor and the following one does better still. We have to find better ways, in my view, to engage individuals and groups seeking a moderate Middle East. We must foster and strengthen them and help them network with each other and like-minded groups around the world. The extremists have well-funded, well highly capable transitional, transnational networks that are organized. They have local cadres in each country. In this regard, we have two key challenges one is that we have to find a way to support moderates without undermining them, without making them seem to be an instrument of someone else's policies. I believe that this can be done by developing trans transnational ties among reformers, drawing on the examples of those who have pushed for reform Eastern Europe, in East Asia, in Latin America, and other regions, and to try to ch channel our support to moderates in the Middle East through such networks. Some transnational organizations along these lines already exist, associated example with the community of democracies. But we may need to create new organizations structured along the lines, for example, of the Congress for Cultural Freedom in the early years of the Cold War. Another possible solution would be to provide resources to groups in democratic and reformist countries in the Muslim world, Indonesia, Turkey, and others to engage with their counterparts in other countries. Moderates who are succeeding may be the greatest catalyst for change. The other challenge that we have not solved is to find ways to level the political playing field, particularly in elections. Extremist elements and parties receive organizational support and money from their allies abroad, giving them an enormous advantage in competing with moderate groups who have no such resources. The instrument we have, the National Endowment for Democracy and other such organizations, are limited in their mission and do not give operational support to democratic forces. And countries open, as countries open up their political systems, it's imperative to develop approaches to ensure a level playing field in terms of operational political resources. More broadly, we need to develop a greater capability to engage and mobilize those who share universal values. Different societies will have their own approaches, colored by their own history and culture, yet we can help them. 
We did this in the Cold War through Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, exchange programs, and many other means. Think of the great successes that we had in Poland near the end of the Cold War with the support by the American unions of solidarity or by the, the efforts of the Catholic Church in that society. Think of the positive effects of American civil society organizations in the color revolution of the last 10 years. We need to identify and support analogous efforts that are appropriate to the broader Middle East. Support for educational reform, independent and progressive media, university to university partnerships, large scale exchange program, investment funds to support business and entrepreneurs, bridge building among civil society organization. These and many other techniques should be used. I know that this can be, this can work because in a way, I'm a product of it. I was an, an American field service exchange student in high school and I attended the American University of Beirut. These efforts and institutions create personal connections, transfer social knowledge, and help societies like Afghanistan draw lessons from the developed world and other successful nations. As ambassador, I helped to start the American University of Afghanistan and the American University of Iraq. This is just a start, but such efforts should be multiplied and increased many fold and across the broader region. We have not even scratched the surface of what needs to be done in this domain. I spoke of the competition for the Middle East. This competition, this struggle for the future of the broader Middle East will be the work of generations requiring patience, determination, and sustained cooperation with like-minded leaders and groups, not only throughout the region, but the world. All countries have a profound interest in achieving a sustainable, lasting peace in the broader Middle East, and we must work together. Harnessing the potential for cooperation among like-minded nations from Europe and Asia and beyond to help moderates oppose extremists in the broader Middle East and assist the people of this region to make the region as functioning as possible should be the, local, the focal point of our global strategy. We and the generations that came before us prevailed in previous struggles, not just because of our material resources, our military might, or the sacrifice of so many lives, when we prevailed, it was not merely a triumph of one great power over another, it was a triumph of a concept of humanity that vindicated the dignity of every individual. I'd like to address the students for a minute. I believe that you have roles to play in this competition. It is the, the future of this region is the, defining, the, as I said, the defining challenge of our time. Your generation should realize, should, should seize the moment to become engaged in this effort, just as your predecessors did in Europe, Asia, and Latin America. This requires you to learn, the, uh, to learn the region, its languages, and cultures. You should consider a career in public service, but everyone can play a role. If you work in the private sector, you should seek to find ways to use our enormous cap capacity to generate wealth to fashion profitable joint ventures in these countries. If you work in the media, you should not only educate the American people about the region, but develop collaborative relationships with the media in the region. <laughs> there is no limit to how you can make a difference, and the security of our country, as well as the lives of Afghans, Iraqis, and others, depend on, on you doing so. Thank you very much, and now I would be happy to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, we do have a few minutes uh, for questions. I th I'm uh, John Coatsworth, the Acting Dean of, um, of SIPA. Uh, I think since I've been sitting next to um, uh, the Ambassador for, the, uh, for a few minutes and may do so again, I should make perfectly clear that I am not now and have never been an official of the Islamic Republic of, of um, Iran. <laughs> uh, if you have a question, there is a uh, microphone in the middle of the room. Please state your name and try and keep your questions brief. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for coming to SIPA. My name is David Trilling. I'm a second year student here. Uh, you have said before that Afghans don't like to be ruled by foreigners. Last week, Newsweek reported that you're considering a run for the Afghan presidency in 2009. Is this true? And if not, can you state categorically <laughs> your intentions or deny the rumors? Thank you. Thank you. Should I do it from here? Yes, okay, sure. 
I didn't come here to collect contributions for my campaign. <laughs> I but know we do I, have a stack of posters in the hallway. Uh, <laughs> I know uh, how poor students are. Uh, uh, and uh, I have seen the, those uh, reports and, uh, and, and rumors. I can say categorically that I'm not a candidate for uh, the uh, uh, presidency of Afghanistan. I'm proud of my heritage uh, and uh, uh, honored that I've had uh, the opportunity to represent the United States and helping the Afghans. Uh, I will always uh, uh, have a place in my heart uh, for Afghans and Afghanistan and will do what I can to be helpful uh, to them. That will be always a uh, part of me, but I'm not seeking a public office in Afghanistan. Uh, I, I am an American and uh, the American ambassador to the United Nations. If I may, I would also just like to thank you as a diplomat for letting President Bollinger know that certain types of welcomes are not welcome at our school. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your interesting uh, presentation. Um, how do you explain the disconnect in United States Iranian foreign policy of U.S. intelligence saying that uh, or stating that, uh, you know, Iran is not pursuing nuclear weapons and the administration saying they are and, you know, deepening the uh, or trying to deepen sanctions and isolation, and then when, you know, Bush wakes up in a bellicose mood, uh, you know, s saber rattling and things like that. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I think the problem uh, is with the definition of a nuclear uh, weapons capability, the pursuit of a nuclear weapons capability. The NIE said uh, clearly that Iran, until uh, uh, 2003, was pursuing a nuclear weapons program, uh, defining it uh, in the, the body of the, uh, uh, the piece as uh, the design of a bomb, uh, the uh, uh, putting of a bomb uh, on, uh, on a rocket, the delivery in, uh, of the rocket, and the research on uh, sort of the non-nuclear components for making uh, a, a, a bomb. Uh, but, of course, uh, 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 in the footnote, there was a broader definition of a nuclear program uh, or nuclear weapons capability, which included the pers uh, you know, pursuing fissile material uh, 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 as well as delivery system. Uh, it, is, uh, it is clear that in violation of its NPT uh, responsibilities, Iran was pursuing a nuclear weapon programs until 2003, and that is clear. It is also clear that uh, Iran is still pursuing uh, enrichment and reprocessing capabilities, which is to get access to fissile material, which is more than two-thirds of the way for uh, uh, getting to a nuclear weapons, and that Iran also has uh, programs uh, for systems that can be used for a delivery system of a future nuclear weapon. So uh, it is uh, 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 the I Iran's pursuing of uh, the fissile material, which continues in violation of uh, the demands of the Security Council that they should suspend those programs, that is a uh, cause for concern. And uh, we understand that uh, Iran has the right to uh, uh, have access uh, for nuclear energy, and we understand the issue of uh, reliable access to fuel for, for, for uh, nuclear reactors. And we're willing to uh, work with others and with Iran uh, to provide assurance of supply of fuel, uh, but we believe, given uh, the uh, record of this regime, uh, its affiliations, its associations, its, uh, its, its, its goals, having uh, this uh, Iran have, uh, have uh, access to fissile material uh, that brings it so close to a nuclear weapon capability is just too risky for this region and for this world. So therefore, we have said uh, that uh, Iran ought to suspend uh, that. So th it, is, it is that com complexity, if you like, about what one means by a nuclear program and that is, uh, that is uh, a part of the... Uh, the, the <laughs> the complexity, if I would say, of the, of the discussions and approaches that, uh, that you referred to. Next question. 
Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, my name is Will Straw. I'm a Fulbright Scholar from a small island off the coast of France. Um, I, uh, I wanted to ask you about your, um, your fourth pillar, um, about um, maintaining Iran, Iran's uh, hegemonic uh, intentions in the Middle East. Do you believe that American policy in Iraq, particularly in uh, June, July, and August of 2003, has helped or hindered that particular goal? Uh, I, uh, there was some noise. I, didn't I think uh, it was a helicopter. The, if you yeah. could uh, Short, try it again. Sorry, and, yeah. and I'll, I'll get a bit close to the microphone. Yeah, um, I wondered whether, in relation to your fourth pillar, um, yes. uh, whether America's policies in Iraq, in particularly in uh, June, July, and August of 2003, have helped or hindered that goal. Uh, uh, June and July of 2003? Mm -hmm. The, the, particularly debuffication, um, the oh, not, not stopping Oh, in Iraq, the the policy, in Iraq. Then, I yeah, thought you meant in Iran. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I, I, I have uh, 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 believed and uh, I argued when I was ambassador in Iraq uh, that uh, uh, the debatification needed to be reformed uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, facilitate reconciliation. Uh, that it, it had to, uh, 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 there had to be a balance, if you like, between the requirements of justice and the requirements of reconciliation, between the requirements of looking back and the requirements of uh, the country moving on forward, and that uh, there would be excesses uh, with regard to both conceptualization and implementation of the debatification strategy, and there would be broad agreement on it, but it was a political issue, so therefore uh, 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 um, uh, we pushed very hard and the last day that I left Baghdad, I, I got uh, an agreement between the President and the Prime Minister to uh, uh, put forward to the Parliament a reform of that policy and uh, after some changes now it has uh, passed the Parliament and I, the Presidency has not uh, uh, ratified it yet. Uh, uh, similarly on the uh, uh, security institutions, uh, I had uh, uh, thought uh, that uh, uh, it would have been better to eliminate some and reform others. Uh, and and uh, uh, I'm sure there's a debate that continues that you're aware of as to uh, whether uh, institutions such as the Army could have been reformed, uh, could have been uh, maintained with reform. Uh, Ambassador Bremer has made the point that uh, it had already disintegrated and that therefore what he did uh, to formalize what had taken place, there are people with alternative viewpoints. I, I don't want to at this point contribute to that debate uh, uh, except to say that uh, uh, as the President has stated that the policy was uh, 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 at that time to, to reform and maintain uh, uh, the armed forces but uh, there has been uh, back and forth. Uh, uh, I, uh, uh, let me leave that uh, 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 with that observation that was different. there is a difference of view wh whether uh, the army could have been uh, reformed and maintained or it was too late uh, with the disintegration that uh, had already taken place. And, and has the instability strengthened or weakened Iran? That was the, well, the crux there is, uh, there's no question that uh, the change in Iraq has been to, uh, 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 wasn't done for that purpose, has helped uh, 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 Iran relative position in the region because Iraq was a rival of Iran, uh, 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 the balancer against Iran, and the balancer has disintegrated or weakened. Uh, and so one of the objectives of Iran, in my view, is to discourage the reemergence of Iraq as a balancer vis-a-vis uh, -vis it. And uh, in Afghanistan, too, uh, the change uh, was helpful to Iran. I, uh, as you know, I've met with Iranians over the uh, many years in my various positions, uh, um, including in Afghanistan, and I used to tease their ambassador that uh, we have done so much for you uh, <laughs> in Iraq and Afghanistan. The least you can do is to be helpful uh, uh, to, to this effort that, uh, you know, otherwise one day you will get a big bill. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 so, uh, uh, no, uh, th those were, uh, those were, uh, uh, you know, they were in our interest, certainly those changes, uh, uh, but it, it, it just happened that it, it also geopolitically was uh, helpful, helpful to Iran. But uh, I believe ultimately, though, uh, 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 Iraq will not be dominated by Iran. Uh, Iraqis, whether Shia or Sunni Arab, uh, they want, uh, they're a proud 
independent people, they are rich people, uh, they wouldn't want to be dependent uh, uh, Iran would want them to be dependent, but that doesn't mean that Iran will succeed. Uh, 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 so uh, I have uh, tried to encourage other Arab states who, who see the change uh, as kind of permanently favoring Iran not to think that way by, uh, and to engage the Shia and uh, Arabs and engage other Iraqis. Uh, uh, um, um, so I, I, I think, uh, but in the geopolitical context, uh, it, it was favorable uh, for Iran. For Iran, yes. Next question. Uh, just to, to uh, comment about the issue of, of the nuclear and so on. Um, I mean, as much as the United States don't want to be dependent for energy supply, I think it's also reasonable to see that um, Iran doesn't want to be dependent on other countries. My name is Leif Holmberg. I'm a second year SIPA student. Right. My question is, question is more. Uh, general, though, um, a recent survey in Europe uh, have shown that uh, two-thirds were considering the United States their biggest threat uh, for them, whereas only one-third was considering Iran being the biggest threat. So that was the question between those yeah. two countries. And I'm just wondering, isn't this a problem for the American foreign policy that how, so to speak, people are viewing it outside, that they are viewing the United States as a big threat to them? and Europe is, you know, have uh, good relations with the U.S. Uh, of long tradition and so on. How do you see this? Well, that, it is a problem. I don't know, question that in terms of public opinion, and, and uh, I follow the Middle East, I followed it more closely, that, it, uh, that uh, our standing has not been, um, uh, as, that, as indicated by these surveys, uh, uh, the support for us is not... Uh, as high in some countries as it ought to be. Um, although in some countries it's, it is uh, qu quite good. The reason for it is, of course, uh, uh, several. One, uh, that uh, you know, as the uh, dominant uh, power, uh, the, that uh, dominance, that uh, kind of unique preeminence of the United States in the world uh, creates uh, resentment and hostility. I mean, we have to, that's unfortunately uh, a fact of life too. There has been uh, the, the uh, effort in Iraq, uh, 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 the, the way it was done, uh, uh, and the problems that we faced in Iraq uh, also uh, has contributed uh, contributed uh, to that. Um, uh, but uh, I, I believe that uh, we can uh, improve our standing. Uh, 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 um, by succeeding in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and, and uh, working with others uh, in terms of uh, dealing with the problems of the region in a, in a multilateral setting. Uh, we need to do better in terms of our uh, uh, engagement, uh, public diplomacy uh, in that region and uh, we face, we face uh, significant challenges. In, in that regard. Uh, on your first point uh, of uh, dependency, we are open-minded on looking at ways to fuel bank system uh, that would deal with that. We're not indifferent to that. Uh, we understand that. Uh, so uh, don't think uh, that the opposition to Iran uh, having its own enrichment and reprocessing means that we don't understand uh, the need to, to, to deal with the concerns of, 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 of dependency. It's just too risky, as again, particularly with regard to this regime uh, in this uh, region of the world, uh, for it to be within weeks of a nuclear weapons capability without violating any rules if it has its own enrichment uh, and reprocessing capability. It can uh, and can work on other elements of the bomb and, and, and bring it together. That, I think, would increase the incentive of others to achieve similar capabilities. And the region is already, uh, uh, you know, very uh, unstable, and that would uh, further uh, uh, destabilize and complicate uh, the security environment in that region. I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions. Uh, I will. Uh, um, uh, I apologize to those who had them. I think we've learned today a, a great lesson, uh, and as Dean of SIPA, I'm happy to, uh, to uh, articulate it, and that is we must do a very good job, perhaps even a better job than we do now, in, in the uh, care 
and sustenance of our assistant professors because you never know to what heights they will arrive. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much. Thank you.